Um, we're very happy to have uh, this discussion today. The title is Armed and Dangerous, U.S. Weapons Transfers uh, to Israel. Uh, and um, this is um, a presentation of a new uh, policy paper that has been completed by the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. And Mr. Josh Rubner will be presenting uh, this uh, policy paper here uh, today for the first time. Uh, and later on today, perhaps when we get to the Q&A session, we'll be distributing uh, copies to all of you uh, as well. And I, I think it's available online uh, as well for those who are watching uh, online. Uh, Josh is the National Advocacy Director for the U.S. Campaign to End the Israeli Occupation, uh, a national coalition of more than 380 organizations, including the Palestine Center, uh, that works to end U.S. support for Israel's illegal 44-year uh, military occupation going on uh, 45 this June uh, of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, uh, and the Gaza Strip. Uh, and uh, so for those of you watching online, we encourage you to participate uh, in the discussion that we're going to have with Josh about uh, this policy paper once we get to the question and answer session. So feel free to send in your comments or questions via Facebook or on the chat roll on the live stream page. Uh, and, uh, and also send us your questions via Twitter by uh, sending them to at Palestine Center. So um, if you could um, help us in just turning off those devices that make disruptive noises during events uh, and join me in welcoming Josh uh, for this presentation today. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Yusuf, for hosting this event here at the Palestine Center. It's wonderful to be here with you all here this afternoon and to be able to present this policy paper, which is the first ever policy paper of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation here at the Palestine Center, which is such an integral part uh, and member of our coalition. On January 16, 2007, a 10-year-old school child, her sister, and two friends were leaving school to buy sweets after successfully completing a math exam in their school in Anata in East Jerusalem. Israeli border police opened fire on a group of boys nearby. The 10-year-old girl ran away from the confrontation and was struck in the back of her head and died two days later. An Israeli pathologist concluded that she was killed by a rubber-coated metal bullet. Her name is Abir Aramin. And Abir's case represents everything that is so fundamentally wrong with this policy of providing US weapons to Israel but one that we almost hear nothing about. Because in this country, we hear about how US weapons to Israel are needed for Israel's self-defense, how Israel is a small country surrounded by hostile regimes in a hostile neighborhood, and that without this US weaponry, Israel could not survive. And in fact, we hear a lot more if we listen to members of Congress about what they say are the supposed benefits of providing U.S. weapons to Israel. Here's Representative Steve Rothman of New Jersey. He wrote in an op-ed in 2010 that the argument that American military aid to Israel is damaging to the U.S. is not only erroneous, it hurts the national security interests of this country and threatens the survival of Israel. Former Representative Glenn Nye from Virginia said on the floor of the House of Representatives that a safe homeland begins abroad, and Israel has long been central to that security. For instance, it is because of Israel's strength and cooperation that the U.S. no longer has to constantly keep a carrier strike group in the Mediterranean allowing us to use our forces more judiciously. However, as our policy paper demonstrates, far from these U.S. weapons being used by Israel in so-called self-defense, these weapons are misused, as in the case of Abir, 
to entrench Israel's illegal military occupation of the Palestinian West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, and to commit the systematic human rights abuses against Palestinians that it does every single day. As a result, these U.S. weapons are being used by Israel in violation of U.S. law, as we'll see. And military aid to Israel, far from being a strategic benefit to the United States, is actually a growing political, economic, and strategic liability. In the occupied Palestinian territories, there are approximately 4.3 million Palestinians. And if the one bullet fired from the one gun that killed Abir back in 2007 can do so much harm, then think about how much damage the entire arsenal of U.S. weapons provided to Israel can have upon Palestinians and do have upon Palestinians living under Israel's military occupation. Just between 2007 and 2009, the United States and the State Department in particular licensed the export of more than 47 million rounds of ammunition to Israel at U.S. taxpayer expense. That's enough bullets to injure or kill every single Palestinian living under Israeli military occupation 10 times over. This policy paper that we're launching today details the scope of U.S. weapons given to Israel at taxpayer expense over the past decade, the 2000s, and documents the devastating impact that these weapons have had upon Palestinians living under Israeli military occupation. And sadly and tragically, Abir's story is one of just thousands that have been repeated that Palestinians have suffered under Israeli military occupation. From September of 2000 through December of 2009, the Israeli military killed at least 2,969 unarmed Palestinians who took absolutely no part in hostilities, including 1,128 children under the age of 18. These statistics are from B'Tselem, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. And as you can see from this graph, sometimes we think that all the sophisticated weaponry that the United States provides to Israel is what's responsible for killing Palestinians on such a brutal and systematic scale. But actually, what's true is that most of these killings are done in a very short-range way, in a very personal way, through small arms and small arms gunfire. You can see that small arms gunfire killed more Palestinians than helicopters, tanks, fighter jets, drones, house demolition, armored personnel car carriers, and all other weapon systems employed by Israel combined. Now again, the population of the occupied Palestinian territories is approximately 4.3 million people. To put that in perspective, the current population of the United States is just above 313 million. Now we all, of course, remember the shock and the horror and the devastation of the tragic events of September 11th. The level of political violence that Palestinian civilians have suffered under Israeli military occupation over the last decade would be the same as us in the United States experiencing 72 versions of September 11th, or one attack on that scale every six weeks. From 2000 to 2009, the United States, during the same amount of time that Israel killed these at least 2,969 unarmed civilians, appropriated more than $24 billion of U.S. taxpayer dollars for weapons to Israel. Of that amount, roughly five and one quarter billion dollars 
was spent by Israel on its own domestic arms industry. This is a unique exemption in the law that allows Israel to spend up to 26% of its allotment of USAID on its own weapons. All other countries have to spend 100% on US weapons manufacturers. This 22% accounts for what Israel spent on its own domestic arms industry with US taxpayer dollars. And then the bulk of the money appropriated, the nearly $19 billion, was spent through US arms transfer programs. To put this into a bit of perspective, this amount of money is the equivalent to $3,175 for every single Israeli man, woman, and child. There are three main weapons transfer programs through which Israel received the weapons that it used with this taxpayer dollar. The first one is foreign military sales. That's a government-to-government -government sale approved by the Pentagon. And these are the big ticket items, things like tanks, things like helicopter gunships, things like fighter jets, the big expensive weapons platforms. The second form and the most populous of the weapons distributed to Israel over the last decade are what's known as direct commercial sales. These are corporation to government sales, which are regulated and licensed by the State Department. The first weapons program accounted for more than 9,500 weapons valued at $10 billion. So you can see relatively each weapon is very expensive. Whereas the direct commercial sales accounted for more than 670 million weapons, amounting to 8.5 billion, making each weapon less expensive. And then finally, there's a program known as Excess Defense Articles, which is a program run through the Pentagon, which basically enables foreign countries to get used US military equipment that the United States no longer has a use for. Israel received $42 million worth of weapons through this program, most of which were Apache helicopter gunships. In total, these three programs add up to almost $19 billion worth of weapons and more than 670 million weapons, rounds of ammunition, and related equipment. These weapons ranged from the truly mundane and everyday one used food steamer valued at $2,100, all the way up to the most sophisticated and advanced of US weapon systems. Here, 93 F-16D fighter jets were given to Israel valued at $2.5 billion and quite literally every possible weapon that you can think of in between these two extreme examples. Our research found that the United States transferred to Israel nearly 500 different types of weapons over the last decade, making it virtually inconceivable that the Israeli military could do anything, even the most routine task, like set out on a patrol without utilizing US weapons. We have a website, weaponstoisrael.org, that details these weapons transfers, that documents precisely how many and the value of each single weapon system uh, was transferred to Israel over the past decade. But more importantly, from a human rights perspective, the dramatic impact and the devastating impact that these weapons transfers had upon Palestinians, and you can go to this website and see exactly how these Palestinian civilians have been killed, with what weapons, and you will see how they match up to the exact same types of weapon systems that the United States is providing to Israel. In our policy paper, we present a few different case studies to zero in on how some of these weapon systems are actually being misused by Israel against unarmed civilians, one of which is the very important weapon of tear gas. Since 2009, Israel has killed at least five Palestinian civilians and has gravely injured at least two US citizens with tear gas, including Bassem Abu Rahme on April 7, 2009, this activist from the West Bank village of Bilain 
was shot in the chest with a high-velocity tear gas canister and died. His sister, Jawahir, died on January 1st of 2011 after inhaling copious amounts of tear gas that were fired into her village by the Israeli military on the previous day. Tristan Anderson, a resident of Oakland, California, was shot directly in the face with a high-velocity tear gas canister in the West Bank village of Na'alin on March 13, 2009. The high-velocity tear gas canister pierced a hole through the front lobe of his brain, leaving him paralyzed and blind. In a similar fashion, Emily Hanachowitz, a 21-year-old student from right here in Potomac, Maryland, was also directly shot in the face with a high-velocity tear gas canister on May 31, 2010, as she protested Israel's illegal and devastating assault upon the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. She lost her left eye as a result of this attack. And then finally, in December of last year, activist Mustafa Tamimi of the West Bank village of Nebi Saleh was shot and killed with a tear gas canister. And you can see that the incident was actually caught on camera. You can see the gun pointing out of the back of this Israeli armored personnel carrier. And you can see the projectile actually being fired in midair that a second later strikes him in the face and eventually kills him. Evidence exists that Basim, Jawahir, Tristan, Emily, and Mustafa were either injured or killed by a high-velocity tear gas canister produced by Combined Tactical Systems, Inc. Combined Tactical Systems, Inc. is located in Jamestown, PA. And if you look closely at this picture, you can see flying next to the American flag is indeed an Israeli flag. These are the types of tear gas canisters that are exported by Combined Tactical Systems. The markings on this one says in Hebrew, 40 millimeter round, special extended range, series 0509 USA. Between 2000 and 2009, the State Department licensed the export of more than 595,000 tear gas canisters and quote unquote riot control equipment to the Israeli military. That's that picture times 10,000 to give you a sense of just how many tear gas canisters are being exported to Israel with taxpayer dollars. In this policy paper, we present other case studies like this one on the impact that specific weapons have on Palestinian civilians. For example, Caterpillar bulldozers and the demolition of Palestinian homes. White phosphorus munitions, which were used during Israel's brutal attack on Gaza in 2008 and 2009. And in addition to these civilian fatalities, we also include information about how U.S. weapons are being misused by Israel to commit additional human rights abuses, such as the systematic injuring of innocent civilians, the deliberate destruction of Palestinian civilian infrastructure, the dramatic and draconian restrictions on Palestinians' right to freedom of movement, and of course how these weapons help Israel entrench and expand its whole illegal settlement project in the occupied Palestinian territories. Those were some numbers and some facts and some statistics on the value and the quantity and the scope and the impact of U.S. military aid to Israel on Palestinians in the past decade. And when you think about the devastation that those weapons caused in the past decade, it gets even more scary and of concern and more dramatic when you realize how many more weapons are going to go to Israel over the course of the next decade. In 2007, the United States and Israel negotiated a memorandum of understanding to provide Israel with a total of $30 billion of weapons between 2009 and 2018. 
you can see what the projected levels of military aid for each year are supposed to be under the terms of this agreement. We're now just into the 2013 budget process, and you can see that the anticipated amount of money there is $3.1 billion. This is an average annual increase of 25% above where previous levels of military aid were before this agreement was signed, or to think about it in dollar terms, that's $3,950 for every single Israeli man, woman, and child. Now, in addition to looking at the human rights implications of these weapons transfers to Israel, we also look in this policy paper at the legality of them. There are two laws that are supposed to govern how U.S. foreign assistance is given and how U.S. weapons are supposed to be used by the recipient country. The first law that I want to draw your attention to is called the Foreign Assistance Act. Here's a quote from the Foreign Assistance Act about U.S. policy. The United States shall, in accordance with its international obligations as set forth in the Charter of the U.N., and in keeping with the constitutional heritage and traditions of the United States, promote and encourage increased respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms throughout the world without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. The law goes on to say that a principal goal of the foreign policy of the United States shall be to promote the increased observance of internationally recognized human rights by all countries. Now notice the language here. This is a very blanket formulation. It applies to each country across the board. There are no special exemptions for countries that we consider allies. There are no special exemptions for countries that have powerful lobbying organizations that advocate for it in this country. This is a blanket prohibition about how U.S. foreign policy should only be used to promote the observance of human rights. And notice, too, that it says human rights are for everyone. And I've challenged the State Department on this before, and they've agreed with me that, yes, human rights apply to every single individual on the earth, including Palestinians. There's no exception in this law that exempts Palestinians from having their human rights promoted by the United States as a principal goal of our foreign policy. Now, if a country violates the Foreign Assistance Act, if U.S. foreign assistance is not going to the promotion and the protection of human rights, as is envisioned in the Foreign Assistance Act, what happens then, or what's supposed to happen? No security assistance may be provided to any country, the, govern the government of which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. And the State Department itself, in its annual report on the human rights practices of foreign governments, recognizes that, yes, indeed, Israel does commit systematic human rights violations against the Palestinian people. And in fact, if you look at this past human rights report for 2011, it actually comes very close to calling Israel an apartheid state, not in those words, but in pointing out the fact that Israel engages in systematic discrimination against Palestinian people, which is the very international definition of apartheid. It's a discrimination based on someone's religion or ethnicity or national heritage. The second law that is supposed to govern how the United States provides military weapons to foreign countries is the Arms Export Control Act. The Arms Export Control Act sets very clear limitations on how U.S. weapons can and cannot be used. It says that weapons can be used solely for internal security or for legitimate self-defense. Now, in Israel's case, when it's using these weapons in the occupied Palestinian territories, of course it's not being done for internal security. Not even the United States recognizes 
Israel's claim that the occupied Palestinian territories are quote unquote disputed. Even the United States official policy is to recognize this as a foreign military occupation not done for internal security and certainly not for legitimate self-defense. Of course, every single country has the right to engage in self-defense, but it's never legitimate to commit human rights violations against an occupied people that are in violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's never legitimate self-defense to derogate from your responsibilities under the Fourth Geneva Convention to protect and promote the interests of the people who you are occupying. That can never be considered legitimate, not under any standard of international law or human rights practices. Now again, this law sets out very clear consequences for what's supposed to happen when a country is not using U.S. weapons for these very, very narrow purposes only. No credits, guarantees, sales, or deliveries of weapons can be extended to a foreign country if it's in substantial violation, either in terms of the quantities or in terms of the gravity of the consequences, regardless of the quantities involved. Now, what that means in simple English is that you are not eligible to receive weapons if you have used these weapons outside of the very narrow restrictions found in this law. Let's take a look quickly to see how these laws have been implemented by the United States around the world. And unfortunately, there are very many cases in which these laws should have been invoked, but have not been. But here's a world map showing countries that have either had their military or economic aid package conditioned, reduced, or sanctioned completely for violating these laws. And with the possible exception of Zimbabwe, which was put under an arms embargo, I believe, in 2002 by the United States, and I don't believe was receiving U.S. weaponry anyway, all of these countries are probably ones that we would consider to be allies at the time at which they were sanctioned. And in fact, the United States doesn't tend to either give or sell weapons to countries that it believes are not friendly or are hostile. And some of you may be surprised to see that, yes, indeed, Israel is on this map of countries that have been sanctioned by the United States. In fact, our research showed that since the Eisenhower administration, the United States has either threatened to cut off aid to Israel, conditioned aid to Israel, or actually sanctioned Israel and cut off aid on at least 10 separate occasions. President Eisenhower has the record. He did it three times, once in 1953 and twice in 1956. In 1975, Gerald Ford reassessed U.S. policy to Israel and held up the delivery of weapons for six months in order to pressure Israel into withdrawing uh, from territory that it occupied during the 1973 war. Jimmy Carter threatened to cut off cluster bombs to Israel twice after they were misused against Lebanese civilians in 1978 and 1979. And some of you might be surprised to see Ronald Reagan up here. He actually sanctioned Israel twice, once by suspending to Israel the delivery of F-16s after Israel's attack on Iraq's nuclear reactor in 1981, and again in 1982, cut off the shipment of U.S. cluster bombs to Israel for six years as a result of Israel misusing these weapons yet again in Lebanon. Bush Sr. restricted how loan guarantees could be used by Israel and reduced the amount available to Israel for the amount that it spent on its illegal settlement enterprise. And like father, like son, Bush Jr. did the exact same thing when the loan guarantees were renewed in 2003. However, since that time, and despite the fact that since that time, Israel has killed these thousands of unarmed Palestinian civilians, and despite the fact that our research turned up at least five occasions 
when members of Congress or the Department of State either asked for an investigation or actually began an investigation into Israel's misuse of these weapons. Despite all of that, since that time, not once has the State Department notified Congress that yes, indeed, Israel has violated these two laws. Here's a picture of Vice President Biden meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu in March of 2010. You may remember that this visit occurred right in the aftermath of Israel announcing the expansion of settlements in East Jerusalem, which was widely interpreted in the U.S. media as a, quote, slap in the face to the United States. Here's what Biden said during his trip to Israel. The United States will hold Israel, quote, accountable for any statements or actions that inflame tensions or prejudice the outcome of talks. This seems to me to be a pretty good approach for how the United States should engage in a mixture of carrots and sticks to get what it wants out of Israel to advance its foreign policy objectives. And in fact, all foreign policies are crafted in mind of having carrots and sticks at your disposal to get the other country to advance your objectives. Let's see how this reality or this pledge of accountability has worked in actuality. Two months after Israel killed 1,400 Palestinians during Operation Cast Lead, instead of sanctioning Israel for misusing U.S. weapons in such a blatant way, instead of sanctioning Israel for what Amnesty International called Israel's war crimes and, engage, and accused the U.S. of fueling the conflict by sending these weapons to Israel, instead of sanctioning Israel for its weapons, two months after Cast Lead, President Obama actually delivered 300 containers of weapons to Israel just two months afterwards. Instead of Israel abiding by the United States' demand in line with international law that it frees its settlements as setting the right preconditions for resuming Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, Israel has done just the opposite and in fact increased settlement expansion at a time when the United States was trying to restart these negotiations. And in fact, when they broke down because Israel continued to expropriate Palestinian land, did President Obama use that as an opportunity like Gerald Ford did to reassess U.S.-Israel relations? No. In fact, what he offered Israel was not sanctions, but what New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman called a bribe a bribe of $3 billion worth of additional F-35 fighter jets, anti-missile defense systems, and more. And of course, all of this is backed up by a very obedient and subservient Congress that quite literally gets up to applaud everything that Israel's prime minister has to say. So you really have a situation in which the Obama administration keeps on adding up carrots to this pile and keeps on providing Israel with more and more incentives for its bad behavior and more and more incentives for its rejection of U.S. foreign policy goals. And so what does this do? Well, naturally, for the recipient country, it creates a condition where you have no incentive to abide by what the policy wishes and demands of the United States are, especially when you're backed up by the lobbying power of groups like the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which is, of course, meeting today and going on the Hill today to lobby for more weapons to Israel. Aside from politics, in this day and age, we have to ask ourselves whether we can afford military aid to Israel economically. We're now $15 trillion plus in debt. We have vast numbers of people living in poverty and unemployment who lack health care, who lack access to affordable housing, and our infrastructure is crumbling. With the same amount of money 
that we provide in weapons to Israel and which we have to take out a debt for to pay anyway, we could be training 500,000 unemployed people for green jobs. We could be providing 24 million people in this country who lack health care with primary health care services. We could, we could fund 350,000 families, low-income families, with affordable housing vouchers. Or we could provide 900,000 children who are at risk with early reading education programs. There's a real budgetary trade-off for the very real money that we are giving in these weapons to Israel. And if you look on our website, aidtoisrael.org, we have an interactive map where you can go and you can look up your state, your congressional district, your county, and your city to see exactly how much money your community is providing in weapons to Israel and what that money could fund for unmet community needs instead. Beyond the political calculations, beyond the economic calculations, the U.S.-Israel relationship is really epitomized by the provision of weaponry to Israel, also has growing negative strategic ramifications as has been stated by Obama administration officials. Here's former CENTCOM, or Central Command Commander, and current CIA Director, former General David Petraeus, testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee in 2010 about the impact of the U.S.-Israel relationship. He said, Arab anger over the Palestinian question limits the strength and depth of U.S. partnerships with governments and peoples in the areas of responsibility of CENTCOM, that's the Middle East and Central Asia, and weakens the legitimacy of moderate regimes in the Arab world. Meanwhile, Al-Qaeda and other militant groups exploit that anger to mobilize support. So far from what I showed you at the beginning of these members of Congress arguing that U.S. weapons to Israel are a strategic benefit to the United States, people who actually know military matters and are responsible for strategic military thinking in this country come to quite the opposite conclusion, that it's damaging to U.S. strategic interests. Petraeus said this all about one year before the outbreak of the Arab Spring, by the way. Now, Israel has always relied on a number of different rationales or justifications for its relationship with the United States. Of course, there was the role it played in the Cold War as an ally of the United States, Israel's supposed worth to the United States as an ally in the quote-unquote war on terror, uh, which was questioned by General Petraeus in that previous slide. All that's falling by the wayside, and all that Israel was left with was this notion that it's quote unquote the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, with the outbreak of the Arab Spring, even this last argument is losing a lot of its saliency as democracy hopefully becomes firmly implanted in the Arab world, as democracies hopefully take root throughout the region, and as Arab popular movements try, as in this cartoon here, to break free of the grip of U.S. foreign policy in the region. This notion that the United States can rely on Israel as a strategic ally in the region is becoming an argument that holds less and less water. So if U.S. weapons to Israel have such a devastating impact on Palestinians, if they're clearly being misused in violation of U.S. laws, if other countries, including Israel, have been sanctioned by the United States in the past, and if this U.S. military aid to Israel is losing its political, economic, and even strategic justification, then why does this foreign policy of ours continue? And I think a large reason why it does is because of the 14,000 people attending the annual policy conference 
of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, an organization that's the most powerful component of the Israel lobby, but certainly not the only component of the Israel lobby, as we know the Israel lobby is comprised of dozens, if not hundreds of different organizations. And of course, this policy is backed not only by the lobbying power of the Israel lobby, but also by the interests of the military industrial complex. This presents us with a significant challenge as people who are concerned about peace and justice and human rights because we clearly have some powerful lobbies to take on. But I'm happy to report that despite the power of these lobbies, despite the power of the military industrial complex, the movement for accountability against Israel's human rights abuses, the movement for a reorientation of US policy toward Palestine Israel to support human rights, international law, and equality, and to end U.S. weapons transfers to Israel as a sanction for Israel's illegal and immoral behavior to the Palestinian people is growing, is growing stronger by the day. And despite the power of these lobbies and despite the amount of money being thrown at initiatives to counter organizations like ours, efforts like boycott and divestment, initiatives on college campuses, within churches, all of this, despite all of this, we are winning by changing the discourse. We are winning by isolating Israel's behaviors and saying that they are illegitimate and by standing up as citizens and saying that we want our country's foreign policy to be better. I leave you with the stirring words of U.S. citizen Rachel Corey who was killed on March 16th of 2003 as she stood nonviolently to protect a Palestinian home from being demolished in Rafah, in the Gaza Strip, and was run over by the Israeli military with a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer provided to the Israeli military at U.S. taxpayer expense. Before she was killed, Rachel wrote home that the international media and our government are not going to tell us that we are effective, important, justified in our work, courageous, intelligent, valuable. We have to do that for each other. And one way we can do that is by continuing our work visibly. Help us to continue our work visibly by taking action today by signing these postcards to President Obama to end U.S. military aid to Israel and redirect the money to unmet community needs. And for those of you who are watching at home, you can do so by going to our website, aidtoisrael.org. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, Josh. Uh, my name is Meher. I run a political economy blog on the MENA region, PETA Policy. Uh, my question actually goes back to the tool that you had up there earlier, uh, looking at how, if the funds were put out differently, how it would address our, maybe our own counties or states' needs. Um, I really, I really like this tool, but in order for me to talk about it more and convince others that this is a legitimate way or shifting the paradigm, what kind of went behind this in terms of calc, like what were the variables used to kind of calculate, oh, this is where we got it. Just in terms of making sure it, it's viewed legitimately and not just as some advocacy tool? Sure. Great question. You know, it's interesting. When we were putting this tool together, I thought for sure that we would be attacked left and right for our methodology. And so we put a very detailed methodology on our website, Aid to Israel, about how we determine these numbers. Basically, we combined numbers that were released by the IRS for how taxes were paid by state. And then we took Census Department data to determine how much money uh, each congressional district and county and city was providing as a slice of that state's uh, revenue to the Treasury. And then what we did, to make a long story short, was we looked at other uh, programs that the federal government has and calculated on a per capita basis how much those policies cost to run. And that way we were able to figure 
how many people could be served by each policy with the same amount of money that's provided in uh, weapons for Israel. Thanks for the question. And also, uh, if someone wouldn't mind, we can also start passing out the policy papers. Well, the same question. Uh, Just one second. Wait for the wait for the microphone. And happy to take the question. Right here, hand. On that same point uh, about the, the uh, uh, aid to Israel breakdown by congressional district and by locality, when I used that for my community, I think it told me, correct me if I'm wrong, that it gives you the amount of uh, uh, total money in, in that the taxpayers in our area are, are giving to this cause over the entire 10-year period, but the other figures are on an annual basis, how many each year you could do for the 10 years uh, in each of those categories. And it's, it was like an either-or thing. You, you could choose one of, of the various uh, options there. Any one of those you could do annually for 10 years in lieu of that full amount. Is that right? That's correct. And the reason why we did it that way is because we wanted to make sure that it was very clear that when we talk about here, for example, we have Virginia. And my eyesight's not good enough to read what that is. Some $700 million over the course of 10 years. We wanted to make very clear that this same amount of money over the course of 10 years could fund, for example, the same 8,000-some low-income families each year on an ongoing basis. Uh, we thought that if we did it otherwise, it would, it would uh, have a multiplier effect in some people's mind. So yeah, this is what could be funded each year for that money. Hey, gentlemen here, so the question? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the very well done presentation and the numbers that you presented to us. Uh, my question is, how uh, is this information and study being disseminated to the public and to politicians or their staff? Great question. We distribute this information in a number of ways. Uh, electronic being first and foremost, we have a regular email distribution list that goes to more than 50,000 people around the country. Uh, I think as Yusuf mentioned at the outset, we're a national coalition of close to 400 organizations so that what we do has a multiplier effect whereby we produce these types of resources and other groups all, all around the country use them. Uh, that being said, we believe very strongly that despite all of the great advantages in the internet age of being able to do an interactive map like this, uh, there's still a ton of value in what I would call old school organizing and actually creating resources that enable people to go out and to educate and to organize people in their communities. And in fact, I don't have it on this presentation here, but if you go to our website, Aid to Israel, you'll see a different dynamic map of the United States that shows where we've sent these organizing packets with these postcards and uh, flyers and posters and so forth to organizers in now more than 975 cities across the United States to enable people to have these conversations with their fellow community members all across the country. And in terms of decision, decision makers, uh, you know, we, we often go to Capitol Hill to press our viewpoints. We'll certainly be taking these policy papers up to Capitol Hill. We'll certainly be sending them to the administration. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, we'll have as much access to the administration as does Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Hi. Um, I don't know if there's an answer to this question, but how do you think that APAC has so much influence over Congress and over the president? Is yeah, it just the money? I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's it's magic. Uh, I think it's good old fashioned organizing. Uh, in essence, it's no more powerful than lobbies like the NRA, for example. That lobbies against uh, any form of gun control or AARP, for example. You know, there, there are differences involved because this is uh, an entity that's devoted to a single issue and a foreign policy issue. And by far and away, it's the largest and the strongest of those uh, thousands of different lobbying organizations that do advocate for foreign policy issues. 
but you know when it comes down to it um, you know there's certainly things that APAC has done over the years that have been illegal there's certainly adequate cause for forcing APAC to register as an agent of a foreign government which it currently does not have to do uh, and there's currently a huge civil lawsuit against APAC filed by a disgruntled former employee who was terminated and was the subject of an investigation by the U.S. government. So there's certainly lots of dirty laundry about how they actually go about doing their business. But the reality is, I think, for most members of Congress and for the administration, it's still the case that in terms of their political calculus, this is the path of least resistance. There's a lot of members of Congress and their staffers who will say to us, yeah, we know that this resolution is no good. We know that the weapons are having these, these devastating impacts abroad. We know that we're not helping the cause for peace. We know all of this. But if APAC comes with this kind of a resolution to us, we're going to sign it because if we don't, the consequences are too great for us. There are some who don't say that. There are some who do stand on principle and take action. Uh, not to tow the APAC line, but unfortunately they're, they're, too, they're too small and not yet a cohesive enough block. But that, of course, is a failure on all of our parts who believe otherwise, who believe that the situation should be different. It's a challenge to us to organize institutions and bodies capable of challenging APAC. And we've been at this, our organization has been at this for a decade now. Other organizations have been at it uh, for a longer time than that. And I think despite the fact that we're outgunned, literally, I shouldn't say outgunned and be so militaristic, despite the fact that we're outresourced so badly, for example, APAC's budget is literally 200 times more than ours. Their executive director makes more in, their, in his annual salary than what our entire organization takes in for a year. So that's how outresourced we are. But despite that, we're still having, we, I mean collectively, we are having a huge impact in changing the discourse, in getting greater numbers of people in this country to realize that there's something fundamentally wrong with our country's policy and it needs to be changed. So we got to keep on building. It's not happening fast enough, uh, but we're getting there. Okay, we've got a number of hands that come up. I do want to bring in a question that we got um, from the Twitter feed. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase this um, a little bit, but you mentioned um, the, the different administrations and how they have sanctioned Israel over time up to George W. Bush uh, was the most recent, but none since then. Why do you think that is? Well, I want to say that the very limited sanction that was imposed by the Bush Jr. administration was basically a warm over of Bush Sr. administrations uh, conditioning of how loan guarantees could be used. Not once during the entire Bush administration and the vast majority of these deaths that I cited over over the past decade occurred during the Bush administration uh, despite the fact that, that Israel killed these thousands of Palestinians during that time period the Bush administration not once told Congress that these laws had been violated. So it's not a problem of Obama uh, in fact, the issue of accountability, I think, really goes back to the Clinton administration. Uh, I found it interesting when I was putting this slide together that five of the six administrations that have either threatened to sanction Israel or actually sanctioned it have been Republican. Uh, maybe that speaks to something about the way that our politics are, are structured, where Republicans feel more free to take on uh, Israel than, than do Democrats. I don't know. Speaking as an organization that's nonpartisan, I'm not going to get too into the uh, electoral politics of this. But uh, the problem is really one of a lack of accountability because you see the same dynamics now in the Obama administration that you saw during the Clinton administration, for example. You know, during the Clinton administration, of course, you had the Oslo quote unquote peace process, and you had a similar situation where Israel was acting certainly against the spirit, if not the letter, of the Oslo Accords by expanding its illegal settlement infrastructure. And instead of sanctioning it for doing so, Bill Clinton actually adopted a very similar uh, stance that the Obama administration has of saying, well, Israel, if you're not doing something that we want you to do, here's some more carrots to get you to do it. 
And what does that do? That only encourages the bad behavior more. So I think it's a pattern that goes back quite a few decades now. Uh, and I think it's testament in large part to the growth and expansion uh, of the influence of the Israel lobby over those two decades. There was a time when the Israel lobby was nowhere near as strong as it is today. Um, in the back, you've been waiting patiently there in the corner, sir. Just wait one moment for the microphone. Thank you so much uh, for the information. It was very concrete, very new. Thank you. My name is Oscar. I'm with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is an international organization, uh, a global organization for peace uh, with justice. And uh, I think that uh, in your talk, it came clear to me that uh, there is something tragic going on in the United States, which is a crisis in democracy. Because how can a government proceed in that way uh, regarding the Palestinians and do things which go against all the uh, principles of uh, beginning to begin with of religion or religions you know the Jewish people are religious uh, in the United States the people are supposed to be religious yet uh, how come there is this divorce uh, between the government's behavior and the values of the people so I think that uh, this is a situation which is again very tragic because I think the crisis goes deeper and it goes into values and ethics and the morality. I think we got into that point where the military industrial complex, that phrase coined by President Eisenhower, is you know behaving in a way which is contrary to all the principles and values that have developed through the centuries. Very serious situation. Thank you, However, sir. you gave us uh, some hope and you said that your work for accountability is beginning to work my question is do you think the same thing is happening in Israel thank you again yeah that's a that's a good question and I fully agree with your sentiments that there's something fundamentally wrong with our our so-called democratic political system um, these days not only on Israel Palestine but on foreign policy in general and domestic policy for that matter um, no. Well, let me answer your question this way. I think that there are some Israeli organizations that are very brave and very courageous and that are doing great work to uh, promote uh, accountability for what their government is doing. Uh, we certainly partner with a lot of them. Uh, those that have U.S. branches are in our coalition for the most part. For example, the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions which protests that particular policy. But on the whole, I'd say it's a very small component of Israeli society. On the whole, I think that Israeli society is getting more and more right-wing and less and less amenable to a genuine, just, and lasting peace with the Palestinian people. I think the situation right now in Israel is very analogous to that which faced uh, France in Algeria towards the end of the decolonization process uh, there where the right wing, the settler bloc basically held captive the entire body politic and was driving the, the policy uh, and I think unfortunately that things are going to get a lot worse before they get better but in the long run uh, I have a lot of hope uh, and a lot of belief that Israelis and Palestinians can live together as equals and enjoy uh, equal human rights. Josh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time for uh, today, but I'm sure you'll be able to take some, uh, some questions for people who want to uh, stick around. Thank you again for joining us and for all those who watched online. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>